Severe weather is battering both Mexico and the Eastern Caribbean. On Mexico's Pacific coast, at least 11 people died as Tropical Storm Vincente brought heavy rains to the state of Oaxaca. Rivers overflowed, leading to severe flooding. Residents were left wading through several feet of water. Vincente is expected to reach the southwestern coast of Mexico on Tuesday, while the storm is expected to weaken major rainfall, flash floods and landslides remain a risk. Intense rain and flooding, two landslides and sadly, the death of 11 people, seven minors and four adults. The much stronger Hurricane Willa is also headed towards Mexico's Pacific coast, with authorities urging residents to evacuate their homes for temporary shelters. The storm is due to come ashore after midday on Tuesday, when it's likely to pass over northwestern Sinaloa, a popular beach resort. The extremely dangerous Category 4 storm may also affect Puerto Vallarta, where residents have been preparing for the worst. The intertropical conversion zone has brought torrential rain to parts of eastern and the southern Caribbean. Venezuela's capital Caracas saw heavy flooding on Monday. Highways and main roads were blocked and the Guayer River boosted its banks, causing flooding in several residential neighborhoods. Government officials visited the affected areas and the Interior Ministry says it will continue to monitor river levels. In the areas of Carayuca and Makuto, the heavy rains are reminiscent of the 1999 Vargas tragedy. Social media users reported the overflow of the river La Guzmania in Makuto. Meanwhile, in Puerto Carayaca, residents had to take shelter on rooftops in order to protect themselves from a landslide. Regional leaders stand ready to assist Trinidad and Tobago after massive flooding devastated several communities on the island. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley has been contacted by the leaders of Venezuela, Jamaica, Barbados, Dominica and Grenada. He expressed thanks but indicated that the government is coping for the moment. Our correspondent Keishan Haynes is in La Hoquita in Trinidad. It's day two of the massive cleanup exercise happening in Greenville, as you can see. This is a major exercise where not just residents, but hundreds of volunteers are out helping to clean. And it's not being made any easier. As you can see, the rain is coming down once again. Now, the government has allocated $25 million for this cleanup exercise. Many are saying that's not enough. As you can see, every house, every house on this street, every house all over is completely destroyed. And most people have lost all of their possessions. The government of Trinidad and Tobago also reaching out to regional bodies to collect some more money to help with the insurance and the rebuilding efforts. So a lot of work being done here. Now this is just one section. This is East Trinidad. There are reports of flooding in South, Central and further East Trinidad. So this is a mammoth national disaster as the Prime Minister called it. Highways have only just reopened and very few people went out to work today. Most people either trying to get their stuff fixed or just could not leave their homes. They've been marooned. So this is again a lot of work that needs to be done and this is just the beginning. With less than a week to go until the second round of Brazil's presidential elections, fears about the future of the country's democracy are increasing. Our correspondent, Andre Vieira, brings us up to date with the latest from Rio de Janeiro. Over the weekend, a video was posted where one of Jair Bolsonaro's sons was questioned by some citizens who asked what would happen if justice was carried out against his father in case of charges. And he replied that to close down the Supreme Court of Brazil, he would only need a serviceman and a soldier. Following these statements, ministers of the Supreme Court react in a very resolute manner. The president state that attacks to the judicial power are also an attack on democracy. The dean of the Supreme Court minister, Celso de Mello, said 
These statements are coup statements. Also, the minister Alexandre de Moraes, known for being on the right wing of the Supreme Court and known for siding with President Michel Temer, actually condemned the statements and said it was an insult to hear such statements in the 21st century. Reactions came quickly from different parties, where even the right wing condemned those statements. Former president of the right wing, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, also condemned the statements. The complaints against one of Jair Bolsonaro's have perhaps inspired Brazil to form a broad front against fascism. Former candidate to the presidency, Marina Silva, declared her vote and support for Fernando Haddad, candidate for the Workers' Party. This goes beyond left-wing or right-wing, as there are groups which are forming against fascism. Meanwhile, other groups claim that can simply shoot down the Supreme Court here in Brazil. And as our correspondent Andre Vieira just said, the Supreme Court did take to Twitter to post a response to the statements made by Jair Bolsonaro's son, Eduardo. The report by the Supreme Court President Diaz Toffoli said that the court is a centuries-old institution and essential to the democratic state of law. Toffoli also said, quote, there is no democracy without an independent and autonomous judiciary. The country has sol solid institutions and all authorities must respect the constitution. Attacking the judiciary is attacking democracy. And the Workers' Party candidate in Brazil, Fernando Haddad, with other PT leaders, has hit back at the far-right campaign. Speaking to supporters in Sao Paulo, Haddad expressed amazement and outrage at the remarks made by Jair Bolsonaro's son on Sunday. The former army captain had warned his opponents that they face exile or imprisonment if they didn't submit. Yesterday, he made a very serious video, which I had never seen someone have the courage to do, in which he threatened his opponent with death, threatened the physical integrity of his opponent, saying they won't have a place in Brazil, it's either jail or exile. He said it in those very words. It's record for posterity. We want to talk about the seriousness of the situation, how serious the speech made yesterday in Paulista Avenue by candidate Jair Bolsonaro was. We have just given a press conference and we are asking for an audience with the OAS Commission that is accompanying the election to make an international report. We may be entering the extremely violent process in the election. What Bolsonaro did yesterday was to incite violence. Different evangelical groups have, ha, have been organizing against the foreign candidate. They've thrown their support behind the Workers' Party candidate, Fernando Haddad. Reportedly, this was in reaction to statements by some evangelical leaders who said people who truly believe in God should vote for Bolsonaro. However, for these movements, Bolsonaro represents violence, and they see him as the opposite of what the Bible teaches. One person traveling with the migrant caravan in Mexico has died. According to the public prosecutor, the man in his 20s died after falling from a truck. The vehicle was heading towards the city of Wixla in the southern state of Chiapas. This young man who was traveling along with thousands of migrants heading towards the United States, reportedly there are 3,000 migrants in this group. Another group of thousands is still trying to cross the border from Guatemala into Mexico. Many migrants have crossed, crossed by the river to avoid the Mexican authorities. A UN spokesman has confirmed that over 7,000 people have joined the caravan. Farhan Haq said these were figures from the International Organization for Migration. Large numbers of people are arriving in Mexico today and are likely to remain in the country for an extended period. Um, and at this time, it is estimated that the caravan comprises some 7,233 persons, many of whom uh, intend uh, to continue the march. 
From very early in the morning, thousands of migrants left the bordering city of Hidalgo. Step by step, they made the over seven hour trek towards Tapachula, Chiapas. We want them to support us, to support our children, women, and men, to give us security and protection because we left Honduras without anything. With punishing 30 degree heat bearing down on them, they battled exhaustion, hunger, and blistered feet, but they refused to stop. The caravan pushes on to the promised land as they walked along Federal Road 200. I'm making the journey so that I can have a better life because there we can no longer live and survive there. The government does not help us. People are starving in Honduras and the president does not help us at all. Mexico's government closed the border bridge, but the people of Mexico stood in solidarity with the migrants and their cause and lent them assistance. We all need help, and maybe we also have to migrate to another country at some point. So this is why we must also help others. We ask the authorities to open the way for these people to cross because they are here in desperate need of help. As they continued the 40-meter trek, migrants only stopped once. Federal police tried to persuade them to get into buses that, according to the commissioner, take them to shelters. It's a big shelter. There are doctors, water, baths. We have assured them. However, among the more than 5,000 Central American migrants, many mistrust and fear to be deported. People from the migrant caravan say they will only rest if absolutely necessary. They hope to arrive to the capital in less than 15 days. Eduardo Martinez, Telesur. And we have more news in minutes, so stay with us. Actions have an impact on the environment. It's our responsibility to change for the sake of our planet. Let's be part of this transition. Watch, preserve, and protect your green zone. Wednesdays, only on Telesur. Welcome back. Colombian President Ivan Duque remains steadfast in his stance that his government will not resume talks with the ELN guerrillas unless specific conditions are met. Social organizations have now written to Bob Francis asking him to intervene to ensure that roundtable discussions between government and ELN continue. Mainly, we ask Pope Francis to mediate with the government. We ask him to ensure that President Duque does not lose this historic opportunity of returning peace and stability. President Duque, who was visiting Vatican City, insisted that ELN must first fulfill the requirement he outlined, including the release of hostages. I have the opportunity to tell the secretary that I have said to Colombian people we want to progress in a dialogue with ELN. But only if they give back kidnapped people and end criminal and violent actions. Analyst Luis Eduardo Steli says with the freeing of kidnapped victims is an essential element, the government and ELN need to find the middle ground. The conditions are necessary for ensuring peace, and that's exactly what the government hopes to achieve. For the ELN, however, the most important thing is that the government goes back to the negotiation table. Most Colombians want to set aside political differences and return peace to the country. 
It is true that military action from ELN in these 80 days of Ivan Duque's government has not been intense. So that may be seen as a type of willingness on the part of ELN. Government has not yet announced any meeting between the Peace Commission and ELN towards resuming negotiations. Workers from the Chinese Shogun Company in Peru have started an indefinite strike, demanding wage increases. 1,000 miners have downed tools. Labor leaders say the company refuses to raise salaries even though it has increased its profits. Workers also say their employer committed labor violations by replacing protesting employees with temporary workers. Peruvian President Martin Vizcarra has rejected the law that would allow the former president, Alberto Fujimori, to remain under house arrest. Our correspondent has the details. The government of Peru has rejected the humanitarian law which would effectively allow elderly prisoners to comply with house arrest sentences. Now the law has returned to Congress to be modified. In the meantime, the former president will have to return to prison after his pardon was overturned. The judiciary system and the government need to deeply analyze this law so prisoners cannot use this to be released. This could represent a threat to society. This needs to be discussed and analyzed. According to a letter sent by President Martin Vizcarra to Congress, this law could benefit the former president directly as he was sentenced for human rights violations. Vizcarra says any proposal of this law would also be an attack on the independence of the judiciary. But Fujimori's supporters responded to these claims. The law will return to the Commission of Justice and the people in favor and against the law will be debated. Democracy will prevail because the judiciary system needs to be changed and some amendments of this law will change too. For the relatives of the victims of Fujimori's administration, the measure taken by the president does not guarantee anything. This is because Congress could vote to pass the law. The National Congress could pass the law because the popular force has a majority. They can do whatever they want, but we're going to keep fighting until the end. We have been fighting for 26 years and we're not going to give up now. It's not fair what they are doing to us. If the National Congress passes this law, Fujimori, his former counselor, Vladimiro Montesinos, and paramilitary members that executed hundreds of people would be released. Students in Costa Rica are lending their support to the general strike, which is now entering its seventh week. Young students are also demanding that they be exempted from the university entrance examinations. They say classes have been affected by the nationwide strike, so they have not been able to prepare for any tests. Costa Rica has been under an open-ended strike as workers reject the tax, tax reform being passed by the government. California's homeless population is seeing a rise in typhus, particularly on Los Angeles' um, Skid Row. Typhus is a disease spread by fleas carried by rats or pests, posing a higher risk when people live on the streets near garbage. Despite the city's efforts to clean and reduce the typhus carrying fleas, the number of cases has risen. Local government measures are simply unable to ensure decent living conditions for the country's largest cluster of homeless residents. Peruvian government officials have announced the unearthing of a 800-year-old wooden island at the Chan Chan Archaeological Complex in northern Peru. With 20 sculptures found in an intricate adobe wall, they are the oldest to be unearthed at the site, according to researchers. Peru's Minister of Culture said the figures appear to be at the entrance of an important ceremonial center or plaza. They believe the figures may have been created around the year 1100. We're going to take another short break now. World News is next.
with developing events being presented through analysis. Our coverage transcends borders. With renowned journalist Walter Martinez. Salud amigos, tripulantes de nuestra querida, contaminada y única nave espacial. Dossier. Weekdays. Only on Telesur. Y pongo usted de las cámaras, señor director. Welcome back. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has given some of the details of the investigation into the killing of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. He confirmed that the murder was pre-planned and that a 15-member death squad was involved. He said the Saudi authorities said that Khashoggi's body was handed over to a local collaborator. He also demanded that all of the 18 suspects involved should be extradited to Turkey to be tried according to the law of that republic. The information and the evidence that we have so far collected indicate that Jamal Khashoggi was slain in a vicious, violent murder. Whitewashing such barbarity will, of course, injure and wound the conscience of all humanity. And we are, of course, looking forward to the same sensitivity being demonstrated by the administration of Saudi Arabia and all other parties to this affair. Dear friends, the Saudi Arabian administration took an important step by acknowledging and admitting the murder. And now our expectation from them going forward is that all those responsible from the highest degree, highest level to the lowest level will be highlighted, will be brought to justice and will get the punishment they deserve. And in Saudi Arabia, the energy minister also spoke about the murder and said that it cannot be justified. But he didn't specify what steps the government is taking to deliver justice. Uh, nobody in the kingdom uh, can justify it or explain it. And from the leadership on down, uh, we're uh, very uh, upset uh, about what has happened. Uh, and of course, the king has uh, made it clear that there will be uh, investigation, justice, uh, and retribution to those responsible. A major bridge project connecting three Chinese regions opened on Tuesday morning. Chinese President Xi Jinping declared the opening of the Hong Kong Zhui Macau Bridge at a ceremony. The project includes the construction of a 23-kilometer long bridge, a 7-kilometer long tunnel, and two artificial islands. 53 kilometers in total, it's the world's longest sea bridge based bridge and has the world's deepest underwater tunnel at 46 meters deep. Cameroon has re-elected Paul Beer as president for a seventh presidential term. Beer has ruled the country since 1982. Violence in the polls increased after allegations of widespread fraud. Bia is the second African leader who's been in power for so long after the Equatorial Guinea president, Teodoro Obiang. I hereby proclaim that the following candidate, who will be president of the republic, and also the candidate who received the majority of the vote, is the candidate, Baya Paul. British Prime Minister Theresa May says the Brexit deal is 95% settled. May told the Parliament that an agreement has been reached on citizens' rights, financial settlement and the implementation period. 
this, uh, the UK's transition period will have to end well really before May 2022. We While the vast majority of the deal has been reached, May admits that the Irish border remains a challenge. There is one real sticking point. Young Palestinians are training to fulfill their dreams of participating in the swim team at the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo. 30 young men and women practice on the sea off the Gaza Strip three times a week. Despite lacking free swimming pools, swimsuits and goggles due to the Israeli blockade, they venture into one of the world's most polluted, polluted coastlines. More than 95% of tap water is polluted and diseases related to water are the primary cause of child mortality in the Gaza, according to the World Health Organization, but they continue. And finally, there was no time for feeling sheepish on Sunday in Madrid as thousands of sheep flocked to the streets of the Spanish capital. Known as La Fiesta de Transhumania or Transhumancy Festival, the Willy Parade takes place every year to celebrate the ancient tradition of seasonal livestock migration. The hordes of sheep clat clatter through the Chique avenues of Madrid, holding traffic and surprising tourists on their way to their winter pastures in the south. Shepherds still pay 50 coins, 50 cents per thousand animals, a fee established in 1418 for crossing the city. We've come to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website, talisiotv.net forward slash English. And for our views in Africa, remember you can find us on StarSat channel 461 in South Africa and channel 539 in Nigeria. And everyone can join us on social media because we are on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Tell us your English, I'm Sunny Gray. Thank you for watching.